in glancing over the notes of the 70-odd cases in which I have, during the last eight years, studied the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I find many tragic, some comic, a large number merely strange, but none commonplace. For working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Of all these varied cases, however, I cannot recall any which presented more singular features than that which was associated with the well-known Surrey family of the Roylots of Stoke Moran. The events in question occurred in the early days of my association with Holmes, when we were sharing rooms as bachelors in Baker Street. It is possible that I might have placed them upon record before, but a promise of secrecy was made at the time, from which I have only been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. It is perhaps as well that the facts should now come to light, for I have reasons to know that there are widespread rumours as to the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, which tend to make the matter even more terrible than the truth. It was early in April in the year 83 that I woke one morning to find Sherlock Holmes standing fully dressed by the side of my bed. He was a late riser as a rule, and as the clock on the mantelpiece showed me that it was only a quarter past seven, I blinked up at him in some surprise, and perhaps just a little resentment, for I was myself regular in my habits. "'Very sorry to knock you up, Watson,' said he. "'But it's the common lot this morning. "'Mrs. Hudson has been knocked up. "'She retorted upon me, and I on you. "'What is it, then? A fire? No, a client. "'It seems that a young lady has arrived in a considerable state of excitement "'who insists upon seeing me. "'She is waiting now in the sitting-room. "'Now, when young ladies wander about the metropolis at this hour of the morning "'and knock sleepy people up out of their beds, I presume that it is something very pressing which they have to communicate. Should it prove to be an interesting case, you would, I am sure, wish to follow it from the outset. I thought at any rate that I should call you and give you the chance. My dear fellow, I would not miss it for anything. I had no keener pleasure than in following Holmes in his professional investigations and in admiring the rapid deductions as swift as intuitions and yet always founded on a logical basis, with which he unravelled the problems which were submitted to him. I rapidly threw on my clothes, and was ready in a few minutes to accompany my friend down to the sitting-room. A lady dressed in black and heavily veiled, who had been sitting in the window, rose as we entered. "'Good morning, madam,' said Holmes cheerily. "'My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my intimate friend and associate, Dr. Watson.' before whom you can speak freely as before myself. Ha! Ah, I'm glad to see that Mrs. Hudson has had the good sense to light the fire. Pray draw up to it, and I shall order you a cup of hot coffee, for I observe that you are shivering. It is not the cold which makes me shiver, said the woman in a low voice, changing her seat as requested. What, then? It is fear, Mr. Holmes. It is terror. She raised her veil as she spoke and we could see that she was indeed in a pitiable state of agitation, her face all drawn and grey with restless frightened eyes, like those of some hunted animal. Her features and figure were those of a woman of thirty, but her hair was shot with premature grey, and her expression was weary and haggard. Sherlock Holmes ran her over with one of his quick, all-comprehensive glances. "'You must not fear,' said he soothingly, "'bending forward and patting her forearm. "'We shall soon set matters right, I have no doubt. "'You have come in by train this morning, I see. "'You know me, then? "'No, but I observe the second half of a return ticket "'in the palm of your left glove. "'You must have started early, "'and yet you had a good drive in a dog-cart along heavy roads "'before you reached the station.' "'The lady gave a violent start "'and stared in bewilderment at my companion.' "'There is no mystery, my dear madam,' said he, smiling. "'The left arm of your jacket is spattered with mud in no less than seven places. "'The marks are perfectly fresh. 
There is no vehicle save a dog cart, which throws up mud in that way, and then only when you sit on the left-hand side of the driver. Whatever your reasons may be, you are perfectly correct, said she. I started from home before six, reached Leatherhead at twenty past, and came in by the first train to Waterloo. Sir, I can stand this strain no longer. I shall go mad if it continues. I have no one to turn to, none, save only one who cares for me, and he, poor fellow, can be of little aid. I have heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I have heard of you from Mrs. Farintosh, whom you helped in the hour of her sore need. It was from her that I had your address. Oh, sir, do you not think that you could help me, too, and at least throw a little light through the dense darkness which surrounds me? At present it is out of my power to reward you for your services, but in a month or two I shall be married, with the control of my own income, and then at least you shall not find me ungrateful. Holmes turned to his desk, and unlocking it, drew out a small case-book which he consulted. Farintosh, said he. Ah, yes, I recall the case. It was concerned with an opal tiara. I think it was before your time, Watson. I can only say, madam, that I shall be happy to devote the same care to your case as I did to that of your friend. As to reward, my profession is its reward, but you are at liberty to defray whatever expenses I may be put to, at the time which suits you best. And now I beg that you will lay before us everything that may help us in forming an opinion upon the matter. Alas, replied our visitor, the very horror of my situation lies in the fact that my fears are so vague, and my suspicions depend so entirely upon small points, which might seem trivial to another, that even he to whom of all others I have a right to look for help and advice looks upon all that I tell him about it as the fancies of a nervous woman. He does not say so, but I can read it from his soothing answers and averted eyes. But I have heard, Mr. Holmes, that you can see deeply into the manifold wickedness of the human heart. You may advise me how to walk amid the dangers which encompass me. I am all attention, madam. My name is Helen Stoner, and I am living with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of one of the oldest Saxon families in England. The Roylots of Stoke Moran, on the western border of Surrey. Holmes nodded his head. The name is familiar to me, said he. The family was at one time among the richest in England, and the estate extended over the borders into Berkshire in the north and Hampshire in the west. In the last century, however, Four successive heirs were of a dissolute and wasteful disposition, and the family ruin was eventually completed by a gambler in the days of the Regency. Nothing was left save a few acres of ground and the two-hundred-year-old house, which is itself crushed under a heavy mortgage. The last squire dragged out his existence there, living the horrible life of an aristocrat pauper. But his only son, my stepfather, seeing that he must adapt himself to the new conditions, obtained an advance from a relative, which enabled him to take a medical degree and went out to Calcutta, where, by his professional skill and force of character, he established a large practice. In a fit of anger, however, caused by some robberies which had been perpetrated in the house, he beat his native butler to death and narrowly escaped a capital sentence. As it was, he suffered a long term of imprisonment, and afterwards returned to England, a morose and disappointed man. When Dr. Roylott was in India, he married my mother, Mrs. Stoner, the young widow of Major General Stoner of the Bengal Artillery. It is easy for me to be so, for every event of that dreadful time is seared into my memory. The manor house is, as I have already said, very old, and only one wing is now inhabited. The bedrooms in this wing are on the ground floor, the sitting rooms being in the central block of the buildings. Of these bedrooms, the first is Dr. Roylott's, the second my sister's, and the third my own. There is no communication between them, but they all open out into the same corridor. Do I make myself plain? Perfectly so. The windows of the three rooms open out upon the lawn. 
That fateful night Dr. Roylott had gone to his room early, though we knew that he had not retired to rest, for my sister was troubled by the smell of the strong Indian cigars which it was his custom to smoke. She left her room, therefore, and came into mine, where she sat for some time, chatting about her approaching wedding. At eleven o'clock she rose to leave me, but she paused at the door and looked back. "'Tell me, Helen,' said she, "'have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night?' "'Never,' said I. "'I suppose that you could not possibly whistle yourself in your sleep. "'Certainly not. "'But why? "'Because during the last few nights I have always, "'about three in the morning, heard a low, clear whistle. "'I'm a light sleeper, and it has awakened me. "'I cannot tell where it came from, "'perhaps from the next room, perhaps from the lawn.' As I ran down the passage, my sister's door was unlocked and revolved slowly upon its hinges. I stared at it, horror-stricken, not knowing what was about to issue from it. By the light of the corridor lamp, I saw my sister appear at the opening, her face blanched with terror, her hands groping for help, her whole figure swaying to and fro like that of a drunkard. I ran to her and threw my arms round her, but at that moment her knees seemed to give way and she fell to the ground. She writhed as one who is in terrible pain and her limbs were dreadfully convulsed. At first I thought that she had not recognised me, but as I bent over her she suddenly shrieked out in a voice which I shall never forget, Oh my God, Helen, it was the band, the speckled band. There was something else which she would fain have said, and she stabbed with her finger into the air in the direction of the doctor's room, but a fresh convulsion seized her and choked her words. I rushed out, calling loudly for my stepfather, and I met him hastening from his room in his dressing gown. The walls were carefully sounded and were shown to be quite solid all round, and the flooring was also thoroughly examined with the same result. The chimney is wide, but is barred up by four large staples. It is certain, therefore, that my sister was quite alone when she met her end. Besides, there were no marks of any violence upon her. How about poison? The doctors examined her for it, but without success. What do you think that this unfortunate lady died of, then? It is my belief that she died of pure fear and nervous shock, though what it was which frightened her I cannot imagine. Were there gypsies in the plantation at the time? Yes, there are nearly always some there. Ah, and what did you gather from this allusion to a band? Sometimes I have thought that it was merely the wild talk of delirium, sometimes that it may have referred to some band of people, perhaps to these very gypsies in the plantation. I do not know whether these spotted handkerchiefs, which so many of them wear over their heads, might have suggested the strange adjective which she used. Holmes shook his head like a man who is far from being satisfied. These are very deep waters, said he. Pray go on with your narrative. Two years have passed since then, and my life has been until lately lonelier than ever. A month ago, however, a dear friend, whom I have known for many years, has done me the honour to ask my hand in marriage. His name is Armitage, Percy Armitage, the second son of Mr. Armitage of Crane Water near Reading. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match, and we are to be married in the course of the spring. Two days ago some repairs were started in the west wing of the building, and my bedroom wall has been pierced so that I have had to move into the chamber in which my sister died, and to sleep in the very bed in which she slept. Imagine, then, my thrill of terror when last night, as I lay awake, thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard in the silence of the night the low whistle which had been the herald of her own death. I sprang up and lit the lamp, but nothing was to be seen in the room. I was too shaken to go to bed again, however, so I dressed, and as soon as it was daylight I slipped down, got a dog-cart at the Crown Inn, which is opposite, and drove to Leatherhead. From whence I have come on this morning, with the one object of seeing you and asking your advice. 
You have done wisely, said my friend. But have you told me all? Yes, all. Miss Roylott, you have not. You are screening your stepfather. Why, what do you mean? For answer, Holmes pushed back the frill of black lace which fringed the hand that lay upon our visitor's knee. Five little livid spots, the marks of four fingers and a thumb, were printed upon the white wrist. You have been cruelly used, said Holmes. The lady coloured deeply and covered over her injured wrist. He is a hard man, she said, and perhaps he hardly knows his own strength. There was a long silence during which Holmes leaned his chin upon his hands and stared into the crackling fire. This is a very deep business, he said at last. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet we have not a moment to lose. If we were to come to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible for us to see over these rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? As it happens, he spoke of coming into town today upon some most important business. It is probable that he will be away all day, and that there would be nothing to disturb you. So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to span it across from side to side. A large face, seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun, and marked with every evil passion, was turned from one to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and the high, thin, fleshless nose gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. "'Which of you is Holmes?' asked this apparition. "'My name, sir, but you have the advantage of me,' said my companion quietly. "'I am Dr. Grimesby Roylott of Stoke Moran.' "'Indeed, Doctor,' said Holmes blandly. "'Pray take a seat.' I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I have traced her. What has she been saying to you? It is a little cold for the time of year, said Holmes. What has she been saying to you? screamed the old man furiously. But I have heard that the crocuses promise well, continued my companion imperturbably. Ah, you put me off, do you? said our new visitor, taking a step forward and shaking his hunting crop. I know you, you scoundrel. I've heard of you before. You are Holmes the meddler. My friend smiled. Holmes the busybody. His smile broadened. Holmes the Scotland Yard Jack in office. Holmes chuckled heartily. Your conversation is most entertaining, said he. When you go out, close the door, for there is a decided draught. I will go when I've had my say. Don't you dare to meddle with my affairs. I know that Miss Stoner has been here. I traced her. I am a dangerous man to fall foul of. See here. He stepped swiftly forward, seized the poker, and bent it into a curve with his huge brown hands. See that you keep yourself out of my grip, he snarled, and hurling the twisted poker into the fireplace, he strode out of the room. He seems a very amiable person, said Holmes, laughing. I am not quite so bulky, but if he had remained I might have shown him that my grip was not much more feeble than his own. As he spoke he picked up the steel poker and with a sudden effort straightened it out again. Fancy his having the insolence to confound me with the official detective force. This incident gives zest to our investigation, however, and I only trust that our little friend will not suffer from her imprudence in allowing this brute to trace her. And now, Watson, we shall order breakfast, and afterwards I shall walk down to Doctor's Commons, where I hope to get some data which may help us in this matter. It was nearly one o'clock when Sherlock Holmes returned from his excursion. He held in his hand a sheet of blue paper, scrawled over with notes and figures. I have seen the will of the deceased wife, said he. Stoke Moran, said he. Yes, sir, that be the house of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, remarked the driver. There is some building going on over there, said Holmes. That is where we are going. There is the village, 
said the driver, pointing to a cluster of roofs some distance to the left. But if you want to get to the house, you'll find it shorter to go over this stile and so by the footpath over the fields. There it is, where the lady is walking. And the lady, I fancy, is Miss Stoner, observed Holmes, shading his eyes. Yes, I think we had better do as you suggest. We got off, paid our fare, and the trap rattled back on its way to Leatherhead. I thought it as well, said Holmes, as we climbed the stile, that this fellow should think we had come here as architects or on some definite business. It may stop his gossip. Good afternoon, Miss Stoner. You see that we have been as good as our word. Our client of the morning had hurried forward to meet us, with a face which spoke her joy. I have been waiting so eagerly for you, she cried, shaking hands with us warmly. All has turned out splendidly. Dr. Roylott has gone to town, and it is unlikely that he will be back before evening. We have had the pleasure of making the doctor's acquaintance, said Holmes, and in a few words he sketched out what had occurred. Miss Stoner turned white to the lips as she listened. Good heavens, she cried. He has followed me then. So it appears. He is so cunning that I never know when I am safe from him. What will he say when he returns? He must guard himself, for he may find that there is someone more cunning than himself upon his track. Some scaffolding had been erected against the end wall, and the stonework had been broken into. But there were no signs of any workmen at the moment of our visit. Holmes walked slowly up and down the ill-trimmed lawn, and examined with deep attention the outsides of the windows. This, I take it, belongs to the room in which you used to sleep the centre one to your sister's, and the one next to the main building to Dr. Roylott's chamber. Exactly so, but I am now sleeping in the middle one. Pending the alterations, as I understand. By the way, there does not seem to be any very pressing need for repairs at that end wall. There were none. I believe that it was an excuse to move me from my room. Ah, that is suggestive. Now, on the other side of this narrow wing runs the corridor from which these three rooms open. There are windows in it, of course. Yes, but very small ones, too narrow for anyone to pass through. As you both locked your doors at night, your rooms were unapproachable from that side. Now, would you have the kindness to go into your room and to buy your shutters? Miss Stoner did so, and... Holmes, after a careful examination through the open window, endeavoured in every way to force the shutter open, but without success. There was no slit through which a knife could be passed to raise the bar. Then, with his lens, he tested the hinges, but they were of solid iron, built firmly into the massive masonry. Hmm, said he, scratching his chin in some perplexity. My theory certainly presents some difficulties. No one could pass these shutters if they were bolted. Well, we shall see if the inside throws any light upon the matter. A small side door led into the whitewashed corridor from which the three bedrooms opened. Holmes refused to examine the third chamber, so we passed at once to the second, that in which Miss Stoner was now sleeping, and in which her sister had met her fate. It was a homely little room, with a low ceiling and a gaping fireplace, after the fashion of old country houses. A brown chest of drawers stood in one corner, a narrow white counterpaned bed in another, and a dressing table on the left-hand side of the window. Finally, he took the bell rope in his hand and gave it a brisk tug. Why, it's a dummy, said he. Won't it ring? No, it is not even attached to a wire. This is very interesting. You can see now that it is fastened to a hook just above where the little opening of the ventilator is. How very absurd. I never noticed that before. Very strange, muttered Holmes, pulling at the rope. There are one or two very singular points about this room. For example, what a fool a builder must be to open a ventilator into another room when, with the same trouble, he might have communicated with the outside air. That is also quite modern, said the lady. Done about the same time as the bell rope, remarked Holmes. Yes, there were several little changes carried out about that time. 
they seem to have been of a most interesting character. Dummy bell ropes and ventilators which do not ventilate. With your permission, Miss Stoner, we shall now carry our researches into the inner apartment. Dr. Grimesby Roylott's chamber was larger than that of his stepdaughter, but was plainly furnished. A camp bed, a small wooden shelf full of books, mostly of a technical character, an armchair beside the bed, a plain wooden chair against the wall, a round table, and a large iron safe were the principal things which met the eye. Holmes walked slowly round and examined each and all of them with the keenest interest. "'What's in here?' he asked, tapping the safe. "'My stepfather's business papers. "'Oh, you have seen inside, then? "'Only once, some years ago. "'I remember that it was full of papers. "'There isn't a cat in it, for example. "'No. "'What a strange idea. "'Well, look at this.' He took up a small saucer of milk which stood on the top of it. "'It is very essential, Miss Stoner,' said he, "'that you should absolutely follow my advice in every respect.' "'I shall most certainly do so. "'The matter is too serious for any hesitation. "'Your life may depend upon your compliance. "'I assure you that I am in your hands. "'In the first place both my friend and I must spend the night in your room.' Both Miss Stoner and I gazed at him in astonishment. Yes, it must be so. Let me explain. I believe that that is the village inn over there. Yes, that is the crown. Very good. Your windows would be visible from there? Certainly. You must confine yourself to your room on pretense of a headache when your stepfather comes back. Then, when you hear him retire for the night, you must open the shutters of your window. Undo the husp. Put your lamp there as a signal to us, and then withdraw, with everything which you are likely to want, into the room which you used to occupy. I have no doubt that, in spite of the repairs, you could manage there for one night. Oh, yes, easily. The rest you will leave in our hands. But what will you do? We shall spend the night in your room, and we shall investigate the cause of this noise which has disturbed you. "'I believe, Mr. Holmes, that you have already made up your mind,' said Miss Stoner, laying her hand upon my companion's sleeve. "'Perhaps I have. Then for pity's sake tell me what was the cause of my sister's death. "'I should prefer to have clearer proofs before I speak. "'You can at least tell me whether my own thought is correct, and if she died from sudden fright. "'No, I do not think so. I think that there was probably some more tangible cause.' And now, Miss Stoner, we must leave you, for if Dr. Roylott returned and saw us, our journey would be in vain. Goodbye, and be brave, for if you will do what I have told you, you may rest assured that we shall soon drive away the dangers that threaten you. Sherlock Holmes and I had no difficulty in engaging a bedroom and sitting room at the Crown Inn. They were on the upper floor, and from our window we could command a view of the avenue gate and of the inhabited wing of Stoke Moran Manor House. At dusk we saw Dr. Grimesby Roylott drive past, his huge form looming up beside the little figure of the lad who drove him. The boy had some slight difficulty in undoing the heavy iron gates, and we heard the hoarse roar of the doctor's voice and saw the fury with which he shook his clenched fists at him. The trap drove on, and a few minutes later we saw a sudden light spring up among the trees as the lamp was lit in one of the sitting-rooms. "'It is a nice household,' he murmured. "'That is the baboon.' I had forgotten the strange pets which the doctor affected. There was a cheetah, too. Perhaps we might find it upon our shoulders at any moment. I confess that I felt easier in my mind when... After following Holmes's example and slipping off my shoes, I found myself inside the bedroom. My companion noiselessly closed the shutters, moved the lamp onto the table, and cast his eyes round the room. All was as we had seen it in the daytime. Then, creeping up to me and making a trumpet of his hand, he whispered into my ear again so gently that it was all that I could do to distinguish the words. The least sound 
would be fatal to our plans. I nodded to show that I had heard. We must sit without a light. He would see it through the ventilator. I nodded again. Do not go to sleep. Your very life may depend upon it. Have your pistol ready in case we should need it. I will sit on the side of the bed, and you in the chair. I took out my revolver and laid it on the corner of the table. Holmes had brought up a long, thin cane, and this he placed upon the bed beside him. By it he laid the box of matches and the stump of a candle. Then he turned down the lamp, and we were left in darkness. You see it, Watson? he yelled. You see it? But I saw nothing. At the moment when Holmes struck the light, I heard a low, clear whistle. But the sudden glare flashing into my weary eyes made it impossible for me to tell what it was at which my friend lashed so savagely. I could, however, see that his face was deadly pale and filled with horror and loathing. He had ceased to strike and was gazing up at the ventilator, when suddenly there broke from the silence of the night the most horrible cry to which I have ever listened. It swelled up louder and louder, a hoarse yell of pain and fear and anger, all mingled in the one dreadful shriek. They say that away down in the village and even in the distant parsonage, that cry raised the sleepers from their beds. It struck cold to our hearts, and I stood gazing at Holmes and he at me, until the last echoes of it had died away into the silence from which it rose. What can it mean? I gasped. It means that it is all over, Holmes answered, and perhaps after all it is for the best. Take your pistol, and we shall enter Dr. Roylott's room. With a grave face he lit the lamp and led the way down the corridor. Violence does in truth recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Let us thrust this creature back into its den, and we can then remove Miss Stoner to some place of shelter, and let the county police know what has happened. As he spoke he drew the dog whip swiftly from the dead man's lap, and throwing the noose round the reptile's neck, he drew it from its horrid perch, and, carrying it at arm's length, threw it into the iron safe, which he closed upon it. Such are the true facts of the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, of Stoke Moran. It is not necessary that I should prolong a narrative which has already run to too great a length by telling how we broke the sad news to the terrified girl, how we conveyed her by the morning train to the care of her good aunt at Harrow, of how the slow process of official inquiry came to the conclusion that the doctor met his fate while indiscreetly playing with a dangerous pet. The little which I had yet to learn of the case was told me by Sherlock Holmes as we travelled back next day. I had, said he, come to an entirely erroneous conclusion, which shows, my dear Watson, how dangerous it always is to reason from insufficient data. The presence of the gypsies and the use of the word band, which was used by the poor girl, no doubt, to explain the appearance which she had caught a horrid glimpse of by the light of her match, were sufficient to put me upon an entirely wrong scent. I can only claim the merit that I instantly reconsidered my position when, however, it became clear to me that whatever danger threatened an occupant of the room could not come either from the window or the door. My attention was speedily drawn, as I have already remarked to you, to this ventilator and to the bell-rope which hung down to the bed. The discovery that this was a dummy and that the bed was clamped to the floor, instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something passing through the hole and coming to the bed. The idea of a snake instantly occurred to me, and when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with a supply of creatures from India, I felt that I was probably on the right track. The sight of the safe, the saucer of milk, and the loop of the whipcord were enough to finally dispel any doubts which may have remained. The metallic clang heard by Miss Stoner was obviously caused by her father hastily closing the door of his safe upon its terrible occupant. 
Having once made up my mind, you know the steps which I took in order to put the matter to the proof. I heard the creature hiss, as I have no doubt that you did also, and I instantly lit the light and attacked it, with the result of driving it through the ventilator, and also with the result of causing it to turn upon its master at the other side. Some of the blows of my cane came home and roused its snakish temper, so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimesby Roylott's death, and I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.